Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. It's great to be here. Thank you to the leadership of Shuva um, for giving me a chance to be up here, share with you what God's put on my heart. I'm really excited uh, to share a little tidbits of um, what God's been doing in my life, and I think I uh, would really encourage you all this morning. Um, little CPM side note, um, I'm really excited to see what God has for me, especially being aligned with an organization that is worldwide, has a worldwide influence, and I think that I would be a really great uh, asset to their organization and be impactful for them. And I'm really excited to see how God's going to use me uh, to uh, reach the next generation because it's that time. The next generation needs to step up, own their faith, and move forward just as you have done over the past 20 to 30 years. So that's kind of what's going on here. So I'm really excited, I'm really excited to see what God has for me, for my wife Hannah. And I just would ask each and every one of you to pray for us. Um, it's a big step in our lives. It's something where if you choose to serve the Lord, there are ups and there are downs. And so all and any prayers um, are well appreciated. And on the side note of prayer, if you couldn't see from the title of this message or what we've been talking about, um, the topic of this morning is prayer. And I wanted to get into the essentials of prayer. And what do I mean by essentials? I mean, what can you do when you approach the Lord in prayer What can you infuse in your prayers that are essential to making your prayer life as healthy as possible? The essentials of that. What goes into that? If you look at this graphic right here, this picture of a Jewish man praying, we see the tefillin and the phylacteries uh, wrapped on his forehead. These are physical representations of, in the Jewish community, what they do when they reach out to God in prayer. Because in the Jewish community, prayer is essential to their life, communing with God, reaching out to God, the music that goes into the prayer, and bringing in God's presence into their lives so that they can recharge and go into the next day and the next week and the next week and so forth. But what I think is really a blessing for us as believers in the Messiah is we have something that, unfortunately, they don't. We have the Spirit of God dwelling inside of us. Amen? We have His presence with us now in this room. So that when we do pray, when we do reach out to God, we can be assured that his presence is right there with us, encouraging us, giving us wisdom, giving us guidance, moving us forward. Because that is one of the main reasons why, if not eternal life, but we want God with us wherever we go. Because this world is not the best place to be in. There are things thrown at us that we're not exactly asking for on a daily basis, right? We're asked to do things that sometimes we need divine intervention for. And we have direct access to the Father. So that's why I think that prayer would be such a great thing to go into this morning and the essentials of that. What are the things that we can do in our daily prayer life that will make the Spirit of God move us in ways that we can never imagine through our prayer, through our conversation? So if you could, take out your outlines for me. And we're going to go over our main idea this morning. And our main idea this morning is that we should use prayer to draw closer to God so that we can live a life that's in tune with His presence. For all you music people out there, if you've ever tuned an instrument, it's a process, right? You tune the instrument, you play the instrument to make sure it sounds good. You might need to tune it a little more, tune it adjust it a little less so you can get that perfect sound. And that's why I think it is so perfect with what prayer is in our relationship with God because it's a tuning process, right? When we pray and we reach out to God, there are things that work and there are things that don't. We have tendencies in our life that are fleshly that we, where we want things. So we have to tune ourselves back in how we pray to God and not expect things and not want things and let God do what He does in His timing and in his purpose. So that's why I think that this main idea is so impactful going forward. We can use prayer. We can use that conversation to draw closer, because remember, that's what we want. That's what our unbelieving Jewish brothers and sisters want. They want to be closer to God. Now, they have a curtain, they're blind, and we pray every day that that curtain will be withdrawn so that they would come to know and trust Yeshua as their Messiah so they have that direct access. So that presence, they can be assured that that presence is dwelling in them. 
But once again, it's a tuning process. Remember, prayer is a conversation with the Lord first and foremost. Growing up me, with me personally, prayer, I've I seen a lot of people try to fit prayer into a structure, into a box. I start the prayer, the middle of the prayer, the end of the prayer, which is fine as, as a young person growing up. But as you get older and you gain experience and you gain things in life as far as going through obstacles, experience successes, when you pray, you have to tune it, Okay? You have to understand that it's a conversation, that it's a two-way street. You're not just going to God and He doesn't hear you. God's not just going to you and you don't hear God. It's a two-way street. You're talking to God and He can talk to you. God can talk to you and you to respond to God in many different ways. But remember, it's a conversation first and foremost. Over the past month, we lost a dear brother Mr. Ray, he was such a dear person to not only all of us, but me especially. I always look forward to speaking with him on Shabbat because I knew that our conversations would, I would encourage me just by being in his presence. He was always filled with God's presence. You could sense it. I remember the last time I talked to him before he went to be with the Lord. And I'll never forget his Toward the end of the conversation, we just got into, you know, how do we pray in our day and age, and how do we really experience God's presence with everything that's going on? And word for word, this still sticks in my brain, he told me, Austin, don't ever take your relationship with God for granted. Never. And that sticks with me, and that should stick with you. Don't ever take your relationship with God for granted. Don't ever take that connection that you could have through prayer for granted. It is available to you, but there was a price that was paid, so that, is, that connection is available to you. And remember that. Because as followers of Yeshua, one of our main responsibilities in life is to cultivate our relationship with God. Think about a farmer and he goes through his process of planting his farm. He starts out in humble beginnings, right? He has to till the ground. It's hard work. It's tough. It's not easy. Long hours and long days of hard work fighting against the elements to try to plant his crop. And once he plants it, he has to tend it. He has to watch out for animals trying to eat the seeds. He has to watch out for the weather trying to erode the, little, the, the spruces that come out of the ground. But when it's all said and done and you're able to reap the crop that you sow, that's where the true blessing comes in. So when I mean cultivate, every single day is an, op is an opportunity for us to cultivate our personal one-on-one -on -one relationship with God. It is great that you're here this morning at Shuva. It is great that you're choosing to spend time to fellowship with the body of Messiah. But whether you know it or not, at the end of time, you are going to stand in front of the Father. And it's going to be you and the Father. Yeshua is going to intercede for you, but remember, it's you and God. And if you choose every single day of your life to cultivate your relationship with the Father, you're going to grow and experience His blessings in ways you couldn't even imagine. So that's why I want to emphasize this morning, always cultivate your relationship with God. So, as we go into the outline here, I just want to go into the intro and give you a few benefits as far as prayer goes. What can we experience just off prayer in general when we go to God in conversation and we seek to cultivate our relationship? What does that look like? What are the benefits we get? And the first benefit I think of is we are encouraged, right? Psalm 34.4 says, I sought the Lord and he answered me and he rescued me from all my fears. King David writing those words. You think about King David, what he went through from a young person all the way to the end of his life, the trials, the successes, the people that caused difficulties in his life, even his own son Absalom trying to take the throne away from him. But this was his response. I called out to God and he answered me. I can only imagine the encouragement David was given by God on a daily basis. He can do the same for you through prayer. 
The second thing I can think of as far as the benefits of prayer would be are we, we are given perspective. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 17, it says, For our momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Friends, our Father and Creator lives outside of our time. He lives outside of anything we can consider temporal, right? It's eternal. Anybody know what a Polaroid camera is? Yes? Polaroid camera? Okay. So think about someone taking a picture of Elsie right here with a Polaroid camera. Prints out, wave it around, right? Show it. That Polaroid picture shows Elsie as a little baby, Elsie as a teenager, Elsie going all the way to where she is right now sitting in this seat on January 20th, 2024, and even to the rest of time. I pray you live forever. For me. I'm being selfish. But what I'm saying here is that that's how God sees you. He sees everything. What you've done, what you're doing, what you're going to do, right? And through prayer, we can tap into that. We can tap into that perspective of what is our life looking like right now. And he can give us wisdom and discretion on how to move forward. That perspective, that is so valuable. Because there is no amount of technology nowadays that can predict accurately what you're going to do or what you're going to say and show you physically what's going to happen. We can have assurance from God through prayer that he will give us perspective. And finally here, I think of benefits of prayer. I think of we are equipped. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 9 says, Then the Lord stretched out his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. When you choose to follow God, you are assured that he will speak through you, whether you know it or not. He will find a way to work through you. And that is such a blessing. The Almighty Creator choosing to work through you. He didn't have to, but He does. Because He loves us that much. He equips us. But see, with all of these benefits, there's one little pitfall. We're human. We want things now, right? I want this now. When is this going to come to me? When am I going to get this? I need this now. That's the only problem. We're flawed. I love my mom. Many of you know her. She is a prayer warrior, but a funny story. Sorry, mom, if you're watching on the live stream. When I was, she was pregnant with me, she had this idea of me wanting to look exactly like my father. Spitting image, personality, the way he talks, the way he looks, everything. She wanted her firstborn son to look exactly like her father. And she went and she reminds me of the story every day, most days, that she went to God in prayer asking him, God, I pray he looks exactly like his father. Make him a spitting image of his father. Please, God, please, please, please. Fast forward nine months. I'm delivered. Guess who I look like? Guess who I act like? Guess where my tendencies are like? My mom. But see, that's how God has a sense of humor, right? He chooses to show us that he's in control. We can go to him in prayer and ask for things, but it's all about his timing. So this morning, when I talk about the essentials, what are the essentials of prayer? What can we do in our prayer lives to make it so impactful for us that others would want to do what we're doing. That people become jealous, especially Jewish people. Because remember, prayer is a part of their lives. They're constantly reaching out to God and asking for His presence. Constantly. So let's go into the essentials this morning. What are the essentials of prayer? The first one I can think of is find a peaceful place in the midst of chaos. 
And if you want to turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 1, and we're going to start in verse 27, you can follow along with me. Verse 27 says, And they were all amazed, so they debated among themselves, saying, What is this, referencing Yeshua, a new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. Immediately the news about him spread everywhere into all the surrounding region of Galilee. And immediately after they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew, with James, Jacob, and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was lying sick with fever, and they immediately spoke to Yeshua about her. And he came to her and raised her up, taking her by the hand, and the fever left her, and she served them. Verse 32, now when evening came, after the sun had set, they began, to, began bringing to him all who were ill and those who were demon-possessed, and the whole city had gathered at the door. If you can believe this, think about this. Hundreds of people gathered around one tiny little house. And he healed many, Yeshua, who were ill with various diseases and cast out many demons, and he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew who he was. And in the early morning, while it was still dark, Yeshua got up, left the house, and went away to a secluded place and prayed there for a time. Now think about this. Larry mentioned this a couple weeks ago, but this is probably the most busy day that Yeshua had ever, done, ever been a part of in his ministry here on the first coming. From sun up to sunset, he was healing people. He was ministering to people. He was teaching he was talking to people. He was refuting claims from people who were trying to nitpick his teachings and trying to catch him in a trap. If you can imagine, he was probably exhausted. He was probably experiencing things that we probably experience on a daily basis of what we go through as far as exhaustion goes. He still chose to heal. He still chose to minister and work through that exhaustion. But if you fast forward to the end of the portion we just read, after all of that, after everything that happened, what did he do first thing in the morning? While it was still dark, he got up. He went to a secluded place and he prayed. He got up, he went to a quiet place and he conversed with the Father. Friends, that's what we need to do. And that quiet and secluded place doesn't have to be first thing in the morning because believe it or not, I'm not a morning person. I hate the mornings takes me an hour just to be functional. My wife could attest to this. But what I'm trying to get at here is that you need to find that place, that quiet spot. It could be 15 minutes in your car at your lunch break. It could be right after work. You can go to a park and sit on a bench and just exhale. Whew. What a day. God, what do you have for me? Find that secluded place, no matter how busy you are. Because, friends, I can guarantee you that if you think you're busy now, you're going to get busier. That's just how life is. As the times are, the more technology that develops and the more things that are asked of us, you're going to be more and more exhausted. That's why it's so essential in your prayer life that you go and find that secluded place, just like Yeshua did. That you go to the Father, just like Yeshua did, and you ask for his strength. Because his strength is the only one, is the only thing that's going to get you through your daily duties, your daily tasks. It's only him and him alone. You can chug as many monster energy drinks as you can, as my brother-in-law loves to do. But it's still not going to help. You need that spirit. You need that presence in you. And you can only do that by going and secluding yourself in a quiet place and simply going to God in conversation with where you're at. Think about as an anchor for a ship. Anch an anchor for a ship is used as when th once that anchor is dropped, any weather, any type of things that try to move the ship around in the stormy sea will not be successful. That ship is going to stay rooted where it's at. It might roll a little bit, but it's not moving. And that's what prayer in your life should be. It should be that anchor. That's what that quiet place should be, that anchor for you. When I was steeped in 
athletics. My schedule was extremely hectic. I'd be working out three to four times a day. I'd be doing different types of educational things. My body was taxed, but I can tell you that the one thing that kept me grounded, kept me rooted where I was at as far as seeking God and being in tune with his presence and where he wanted me was finding that quiet place. And it was different every single day. And it can be different every single day for you. But it's so important to do that. So that's the first essential here. First essential is finding a quiet place in the midst of chaos. Second essential here. Excuse me. The second essential here is commit all of your decisions to the Lord. Luke chapter 6, verse 12, it says, Now it was at this time that he, Yeshua, went off to the mountain to pray, and he spent the whole night in prayer with God. And when day came, he called his disciples to him and chose twelve of them, whom he also named as apostles. Simon, whom he also named Peter and his brother Andrew, James and John, and Philip and Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, Jacob, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who was also called the Zealot, Judas, the son of Jacob, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. In this portion, if you look between the fine lines, you can see that this was a huge decision at this point in Yeshua's ministry. He had a ton of followers. Multitudes were following him. But it was at this point that he knew he had to choose a select few. The ones who would be his emissaries, his ambassadors after he was gone, who would keep the torch going so that others would learn and grow at the same rate that Yeshua, when Yeshua was on the earth for, during his first coming. It was an important decision. We are still affected by those 12, even to this day, thousands of years later. But what did Yeshua do? Before he made that huge decision, what did he do? He prayed. He committed his decision to the Father. There are going to be so many decisions that you're going to have to make in life. You've probably made a lot of them up to this point. You're going to make a lot more going forward. If you commit every single one of those decisions, whether big or small, God's going to bless it. Because you see, God just wants to be involved in that decision process. He's not going to control you. He's not going to force you to make a decision. He's going to influence the decision so that it blesses you in the best possible outcome as long as you commit it to Him, just like Yeshua did. After I finished all of my education, as far as my secular undergrad, I really wanted to get a biblical education. I really wanted to be rooted and grounded, as Larry was saying earlier. I didn't know what to do. I hit this point in my life where I was no longer an athlete and I was just this nothing. Who was I? Who is Austin? I don't know who Austin is. That's what I was telling myself. Who are you? What are you going to do? And the one thing that I thank myself years and years ago for doing was committing that decision to God and just going to him and saying, God, what do I do? I don't even know who I am. Show me the way. Show me what to do. And lo and behold, Larry Feldman comes in and plants the seed. Fast forward seven, eight years later, here I am today. It doesn't, doesn't seem like it goes that fast, but it does. But it all starts off committing your decision to the Father and saying, hey, I need your help. I don't know what to do. You need to show me or at least push me in the right direction because I know that if you do, I'm in line with your plan. I don't want to force things. So that's the second essential here. Commit all of your decisions to the Father. And the third essential here is vulnerability in your prayer and your approach is free. Matthew 26, verse 36. Then Yeshua came with them to a place called Gethsemane and told his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee with him, and began to be grieved and distressed. 
Then he said to them, My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me. Verse 39, And he went a little beyond them and fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So you men cannot watch with me for one hour? Keep watching and praying so that you do not come into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And verse 42, He went away a second time and prayed, saying, My father, if this cup cannot pass away unless I drink from it, your will be done. Again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them again and went away and prayed a third time, saying, the same thing once more. And he came to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let's go. Behold, the one who is betraying me is near. And as you know from this situation, Yeshua's first, his life on, during his first coming was coming to an end. He knew what he was about to go through. Insane suffering. Insane punishment. His form would be marred more than any man. The obstacle that he was about to go through was so intense that even the Messiah was asking the Father, if it's your will, have this cup pass from me. Because he knew what was going to happen. He was honest. Friends, Yeshua was vulnerable. And if our Messiah can be that vulnerable with the Father, so can you. Especially in your approach to prayer. Because remember... It's a conversation. God knows who you are. God knows what you're thinking. God knows what you've done, what you will do. All he's asking is for vulnerability of where you're at. Because he wants to encourage you. He wants to bless you. He takes great joy in seeing that vulnerability. Obviously, Yeshua carried out his mission and his goal during his first coming, right? We can commune with his presence because of what Yeshua did. He still went through with it, but that doesn't mean he was any less vulnerable. His approach to God was so contrite and honest, and it's such a great example for us because it can set us free. Right in our world, in our day, in our age today, being vulnerable is looked down upon. Showing emotion at times is, that's embarrassing. That's not what you want to do. Why would you want to be open? You want to blend in. You don't want to stand out. I'm here to reverse that narrative and say that this is what God wants. He wants you to stand out. He wants you to be vulnerable. He wants you to reach out to him with honesty. And the Father and the Father alone is the only one that can set you free. No matter what you're going through, no matter what you've done. I've gone through a lot of health things in my life. Been through a few surgeries to the point where I almost lost feeling in my left leg and was going to go paralyzed in my left leg where I couldn't even walk. But the one thing that kept me going through the entire rehabilitation process in my life, through those injuries and through those health scares and health problems, was I was vulnerable with the Father. I was honest with where I was at in life. And I reached out to Him, asking Him for simply His guidance because I knew that that was the only thing that was going to get me through the next day and the next day and the next day. So friends, I encourage you to be vulnerable not just Monday, Wednesday, Friday, not just Tuesday, Thursday, not just Shabbat Saturdays at Shuba. I'm encouraging you to be vulnerable every single day with the Father because it's going to set you free. So let's bring all this together here. In our conclusion, what's our responsibility? One, our first responsibility is converse with him daily. Make it a point to go to him in conversation every single day. Because you are tapping into that presence every single day. And that presence can help you. Find that peace in the midst of chaos. Understand that by doing that, you are fulfilling your role in calling on this earth in your relationship with God. Because that's all God wants is a relationship. Without prayer, 
you're not taking full advantage of the direct access that you have to God. If you're choosing to pray sometimes, you're not taking full advantage. Our second responsibility is remember, commit all of your decisions to the Lord. Both big and small, whatever you do, whatever you think about doing, commit it to God. He is there to hear you, right? We had a Messiah that came, Yeshua, to serve us, not to be served. He laid his life down for us. He didn't ask us to lay our lives down for him. Commit all of your decisions to the Lord. The Lord really wants to be a part of that decision process. He really wants to be in the trenches with you. That's where he gets pleasure. He wants to be a part of your daily life. Let him in. And the final responsibility here is, like I was saying earlier, be vulnerable in your approach through prayer. Understand that if you're vulnerable, God's only going to set you free. And you're going to be more encouraged to share what God did for you with others. And the snowball effect goes further and further. So I talked about my mom. Now I'm going to talk about my bonus mom, I like to call her. She's my mother-in-law. But a couple of weeks ago, she sent me a little screenshot of one of her devotionals. And it talked about Yeshua being the good shepherd. It talked about what he can do for us, what he's doing for us. And if we simply tap into what his abilities are, our lives will be so much better. And I wanted to take out a little snippet of that and read that for you this morning. Because it goes in perfectly of what prayer can do for us. So it goes like this. Yeshua knows you intimately and has known you forever. He knows your strongest talents and your greatest failures. He knows your every thought. He knows the anxieties that you carry with you from childhood, your fulfilled and unfulfilled desires, your happiest times, and your most profound grief. Yeshua not only knows you, He loves you. He longs to lead you to life's highest possible joy and greatest satisfaction found in him alone. The good shepherd who knows you completely loves you perfectly, and he alone can hold you eternally safe and secure. Amen? It's such an encouragement to know that you have a good shepherd who's in your corner, who you can go to in prayer, and you can be assured that his presence will live with you through every experience in your life. So that's why I think it's so important that we should use prayer to draw closer to God so that we can live a life that's in tune with His presence. Let's pray. Avinu Shabbat Shemayim, our Father in Heaven, thank You for just who You are and what You've done for us. The sacrifice that Your Son Yeshua made for us so that we can have direct access to you. I pray, Lord, that as our dear friend Ray said, that we would never take our relationship for granted with you. We would always value the connection we have. That we would always choose to find that quiet place, to commit our decisions to you and be as vulnerable as possible in our approach. All we want is for you to be a part of our daily lives. And I pray that everyone in this room would make that decision and make that commitment to seek you every single day through that connection. We thank you for loving us so much that you chose to send your son to die for us even though we don't deserve it. To give us that connection even though we don't deserve it. We are so thankful for who you are and what you're doing in our lives and what you're going to do. So we lift all of these things in your Son Yeshua's name. Amen.